Like we do it, like we do it. Hi, 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 guys. Welcome back and happy Friday. Okay, so it's been a long time, and this is one of my favorite content creators, as you guys know. And now it's so fun because I feel like we've passed that threshold of being just content creators and fellow collaborators to just one of my greatest friends that I've met from the internet. Next week, I can't wait to share more with you because I'm doing a behind the scenes and you'll definitely see glimpses of her, but she's the number one badass legal commentator on YouTube. It's Emily D. Baker. Not only to talk about the Grizzlies big win, Tom and Ariana with this lawsuit over the house, but also what is with the balloons? I can't with the balloons. StreamYard, I don't know what we're doing, but also Tom Girardi's competency. Yeah, we have a lot to discuss. So before we jump in, go ahead, smash that like button. If you're not subscribed, get subscribed. Don't forget to hit that notification bell and let's welcome Emily. Hello. Oh, I can't hear you. Oh. Oh, there you are. I got muted as I came in. Um, oh. I can tell you what's going on with the balloons. That is an iOS thing on Apple. That is not a StreamYard thing. So okay. it is an iOS thing. I know yeah. I saw the thumbs up too. And I'm like, so oh, that is an iOS thing. If you look at your, your window, there's like a little camera with a green outline and you can turn reactions off and on. So I, I kind of like the surprise reactions. They throw me I, I'm here for it. There's one that has like, like laser lights and stuff. I love the unexpected vibe, but that's what it is. <laughs> yes. Well, you <laughs> look amazing and it's great to see you. I haven't seen you since BravoCon. I know we haven't gotten to see each other in person nearly enough, but next week we're going to fix that. So hello, Adam's family. It's good to see all of you. And um, I can't wait to talk reality TV. Well, have you talked about any plans for next week or no? Not much um, because I do, since my content is so legal, I don't do any of that on YouTube except for my members and then on Instagram. So the behind the scenes will be in member spaces and Instagram because my content is legal documents and court cases and stuff like that. But I'm so excited to go to LA with you and go to Vanderpump and do all the things. I'm ready. Guys, so we were talking about the Vanderpump Rules premiere and I was just talking to Emily before we get into this. And it's sort of on topic since we're going to mention Tom and Ariana, but- Totally on topic. Yeah, 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 totally. And it's Bravo. We, yep. this year is different. I've gone to a lot of the Vanderpump Rules premieres. As you guys know, Jason and I worked around them, worked for Lisa, and I'm really great friends with a lot of them, but it was always at Sir and all of these like little small venues. And then after Scandaval, how do you say it, Emily? Is it the Palladium? The Hollywood Palladium. Hollywood Palladium. I don't know how to say anything, but I grew up in LA. So that's, <laughs> I got you on the Hollywood Palladium, but it's at the Palladium. It's a huge venue. It's, it's a huge venue. And they actually, I was surprised by this. They sold tickets to the public to come and enjoy the premiere with the cast, which I'm just curious how this is going to look. They're just like, let's let's hit the scandal of it all. Look, Bravo's going to maximize an opportunity. We know this about Bravo, and they're absolutely doing that with the revived interest in the show. I've got to be honest. Can we – there's just a few friends here. Can I be honest? Be, I, be honest. I didn't watch Vanderpump until Scandaval. Do you know what's funny is Jason and I were talking about this today because we were laughing about the fact that – you last year while you were watching from seasons one to ten you would call me and be like what is yeah, this what happened like, what is this what happens next yeah. but it was so funny because it at BravoCon, not last year but the year before you introduced me to tom sandoval and i'm like who who is he yeah yeah i mean who he is again and that's when raquel was walking around in her little tom tom hoodie yes all the unhinged shit that happens at BravoCon, we were there to witness it all so um, it was just, it was too funny then going back and watching the show because when Scandaval happened, I was, I was like, there's a tie in. I'm interested to see the backstory here, but, um, the, I had kind of gotten into Bravo with the housewife shows and kind of continued on with the housewife shows. And when Vanderpump rules started coming out, I remember the crossover with Sheena from real housewives of Beverly Hills. And at the time I was, you know, I had young kids and I was like, just can't relate like i love that you're like out living your best 20s life and getting drunk and sleeping with your friends but i'm like i can't i can't eat like i can't even um just based on where i was in my life so i never got into the show and then when scandal happened i'm like now i need to go back and see the tea 
Now I need to go back and see all the tea. And it was fun. So the chat's asking, did you see Adam's face in season three? Yes, I was absolutely looking for Adam. He's like, these are the seasons you might spot me in. And I'm like, I'm spotting it. You know what? And now it's funny because, well, actually, Jason always says that I say too much. So this will be this will be an off-topic conversation with Emily, but I'll keep you guys interested for sure because we, Jason and I, were offered to interview for Vanderpump Rules. We did the interviews, and then they told us certain things about how they can manipulate content and stuff. And then we chose our relationship over potential being on TV, which now I totally don't regret that decision because now I get to be on the community in this community with all of you guys on YouTube and talk about the shit show you that we are on watching. TV. Like half my audience watches on TV anyway. Like they watch YouTube on TV. I mean, it, it, it is on TV. It's just, it is what it is. Before we jump in really quick, did you notice, I have now noticed that a lot of the friends that I have and they have kids and I'm like, oh my God, all of these people have like these little mean small humans that just do whatever they want and they watch on their ipads only youtube oh yeah my kids on my kid my teen watches some non-youtube content my um 11 year old youtube is like his whole experience but even my 15 year old like a you there's a bunch of youtubers that have recently announced retirements or changing their um changing their uh trajectory with their content like matt pat and stampy long nose and so it's funny seeing my 15 year olds be, being like those are the youtubers i watched when i was a kid like i've outgrown stampy long nose or whatever and so he's he's also seeing content creators that he watched the way i watched like kids incorporated so it's these are the shows he doesn't remember saturday morning cartoons he remembers that he watched a lot of you know techno blade or Stampy Long Nose. It's the YouTubers that they watch that are so um, ever present to them. And we see that at the high school. They sell Prime in the high school's like vending machine, which is Logan Paul's and KSI's energy drink. This is like backed by YouTubers. So YouTuber brands are what kids identify with. Like Prime is a status symbol. It's like the designer drink to have. It's in the vending machines. Kids like walk around just carrying their bottles of Prime. Like all of the all all of the the fun kids are walking around with their stanleys and then like all of the boys are walking around with their like prime drinks it's crazy it's like such it's such an ingrained part of their culture i think i'm getting old <laughs> like, I don't like, i'm like what is going on no, but no, but it no it's just youtube is a really ingrained part of their culture the way like pivotal tv programs are a part of our culture and kids aren't watching reality shows but they're watching like the drama unfold with the you know royal caribbean nine month cruise on tiktok and stuff they they are engaging in a different way and they're engaging with content creators in a different way than than reality tv and we saw that like the difference this year between BravoCon and vidcon the vidcon audience was so heavily teens and tweens and like screaming masses for their favorite creators BravoCon was people in their 20s and up like 21 22 was like young at BravoCon. BravoCon was very heavily like a 30 30 ish and up audience because that's who's still watching reality tv and engaging in this way so it's it's a changing it's a changing thing but yes youtube is the primary viewing for for gen z you know since you brought up BravoCon, which i did but then we ended up going into it I have to bring this up because when you used to, like before when we had you on the channel um, at the times that we did, a lot of the content that we would talk about was the Girardis, right? Mm -hmm. And now I sat and I, I put out misinformation. Oh, what did you know, misinform? Well, I misinformed because I remembered something very differently and I called you on the phone and you corrected me. Um, about Tom Girardi and Erica, and now we know that he has been found competent, right? Mm -hmm. So with Tom Girardi being found competent, I thought that at that point, I thought that they could never convict Erica of anything, uh, and she could never get in trouble unless they got like the head honcho. Like you can't attack the rest of the mafia unless you get the mafia boss first and you you go after them. And that's kind of what I thought. And for Tom Girardi now being found competent, I was like, oh my gosh, this could look really bad for Erica. That's what I 
thought I remembered, but then you told me, no, that's not true. Because if there was something to be found for Erica, they would have just pursued her separately. They would have, I think, um, a couple things. So for the Adams family that doesn't know me, I'm a former prosecutor. Um, so I was a prosecutor in Los Angeles. So I made a lot of these decisions. Um, I've worked with the U.S. Attorney's Office. I've worked with their tax division. I've worked with judges and four judges. So my legal career before content creation touched on a lot of these areas. I spe I focused on, I can't say specialized really, but I focused on white collar crime. So like the fraudy fraud stuff is absolutely my jam, but you can prosecute the lower rungs before you even get all the way to the tip of the spear. We saw that with Jen Shaw, right? You you saw all those prosecutions before they got to Jen Shaw. So they were like taking up the lower tiers of the pyramid before they got to her and prosecuted them easily. So even though they're like, well, somebody else was doing that, it's like, right, but you were doing this. I, I think think about that. Yeah, they prosecuted tons of people before they got to Jen. Um, and I think because they prosecuted tons of people, it led them to Jen because people were willing to trade information. And the feds do that a lot of times. They start at the bottom rung, like the people who are the doers, and then they go all the way up to the people who are the the planners and the like the bosses. That's what some of these statutes are for. So you can get all the way up the chain. But with Erica and these federal convictions or these me sorry guys not convicted yet these federal indictments erica didn't work at the law firm erica wasn't a lawyer these are all counts of stealing from clients and misleading clients it's why we've seen the cfo and other lawyers and tom but not erica and i think if the feds had anything on erica they would have probably indicted her quietly and had her take a deal to testify um, because that would be very beneficial for them because she still has marital spousal privilege with Tom, but she could have tried to testify some, um, but she still, there is still that privilege that she and or Tom could assert to keep her quiet because this all happened during their marriage and they are still not divorced yet. But um, if the feds were going to indict her, they probably would have done it at the same time as Tom. They weren't in a hurry to indict Tom. I don't think Erica's going to get indicted in Illinois or in California on the theft from clients. I don't think she's involved enough in the theft from clients. I know people disagree with that because she benefited, but that doesn't mean she was stealing. Um, the feds don't normally go after like receipt of stolen property because how do you prove Erica knew it was stolen when her credit card bills are getting paid by Tom? And he's the most culpable. The people who are going to come knocking at Erica's door that's going to be a problem for her down the road is the IRS. Like the tax yeah, issues yeah. are her big issues. And I will continue to say it. The tax issues are the big issues. But Tom is the most culpable with the other attorneys in the CFO for stealing from clients. Um, though Erica benefited, Tom has been doing this for decades and his other ex-wives benefited too. So if you're going to go after Erica, you've got to go after the other two ex-wives as well because they were with him while he was doing the same shit. Like he's been doing this for decades. Okay, so I have like a slew of questions for you. Oh, let's go. Um, <laughs> you're like rapid round. Let's do this. <laughs> I love questions. Okay. So for Erica and the IRS, wh when we see so many people like Jax Taylor owed over a million dollars to the IRS, Kim Zolciak and Corey Bierman are facing this right now. We have Angie Kay from Salt Lake City who allegedly owes money to the IRS. Is that something where you are given the opportunity to pay back with interest or will the IRS ever put you in jail for not being able to pay and then you serve your time and then that's kind of so the u.s doesn't have debtors prisons we don't lock people up because they can't afford to pay however the irs will always get theirs and if they find that you are defrauding the irs then they can prosecute you like they prosecuted the chrisleys part of the part of the prosecution for the chrisleys was through the irs even though the chrisleys had paid so even if you pay if there is fraud there which from everything we've seen coming out of the bankruptcy, it looks like Tom had two sets of books, that there was a lot of nonsense. We know that there's millions of dollars owed to the IRS and the California version, the Franchise Tax Board. So not only is there debt there, there might be fraud there, and they can initiate criminal prosecutions on the fraud, even if the debts are paid or not paid. They normally go after that when the debts are not paid. Um, when I worked with the US Attorney's Office with their tax fraud division, the tax frauds they were going after were liabilities in the millions, 
And I think the Girardis are there. And I think the separate sets of books, once the CFO, I imagine the CFO came in, is going to try to take a deal. And if the CFO came and takes a deal, he is going to be instrumental in the IRS coming after Tom and potentially Erica for fraud. Because Erica said in her book and is said on the show, I sign, I sign those, you know, tax filings. I sign our taxes. That is ours. That money is ours. This is all ours. Well, um, if you're signing those documents, babes, even if you don't know what he's doing, it can come back and bite you. So then my next question is, wouldn't the other wives face like statute of limitations because it's been they've been so far removed from this and it's been so many years so that like if they went after erica they wouldn't have to go after the other wives oh for the tax stuff yes it really if there's years though that taxes weren't filed this gets into a very deep conversation but if there's years that taxes weren't filed the statute doesn't start to run so there was a really crazy case where a guy was getting paid by a movie studio um, for doing script work. He was getting paid by a studio that was based in California. He lived in Arizona. He didn't file um, taxes in California for the money earned in California. And because he never filed, the statute never started. So they reached back like 11 years to go get him for tax liabilities that he hadn't paid. So there's, um, there's a lot that the, there's a lot of nuance to what the IRS can do. But generally, if you're filing taxes, there is a statute of limitation on how far back they can go and say, this isn't correct. Oh. Okay. And then my next question is, is since you brought up the fact that I thought that that was such a great point about Jen Shaw and how they started at the bottom in order to get like the big fish. Just sing it. Started at the bottom. Now we're yeah. here. I, yeah. You know, the feds do. You know, some of these federal attorneys are bumping into work in the morning when they've got like, they've, they've flipped people up the line, right? They're like, this guy flipped and this guy flipped and this guy flipped and we're going up. They're like, started at the bottom. Now we're here. They're just bumping into work in their Priuses, like ready to roll. It's, I, I can see it. They're all about it. And that's what I, I completely forgot about Stuart. Did we ever hear anything about Stuart? His sentencing keeps getting bumped and other defendants have popped in and pled. So I suspect, and this is just based on what I've seen on the documents and what I've seen on the docket and what I know from my own working experience. I suspect Stuart still has information that is beneficial to the federal government. And that is why he has not been sentenced yet. His sentencing date keeps pushing back. He has taken a deal with the feds. I think he's wrapping up the rest of these prosecutions for them because new defendants have popped in and pled. So will is there a possibility of him actually not going to prison? Yes, there is. It seems that he's been incredibly cooperative. When all of this went down, like the day everyone was arrested, I was like, if I am Stort's lawyer, I am immediately like, you know, 1-800-FED. Hi, my client is Stort. We would love to have a conversation with you about Jen Shaw. Like day one, yeah. day one, I would have been having that conversation. And now I guess my next question going back to the Girardis is, what do you think? Because didn't Tom Girardi tell the judge F you or the prosecutor? So in the competency, and can we give a little background on the competency real quick? Yeah. I feel like we jumped in in the middle. I'm so sorry, Adam's family, if we jumped in in the middle. Uh, nobody seems to be asking. Everybody seems fine. But either way, Tom Girardi is being federally prosecuted in Illinois and California. Aside from all of the bankruptcy stuff and, and all of that. So there's the theft from clients of Lion Air. That's the stuff with Edelson PC that's going on in Illinois. And then there's the stuff in California, which is theft from five different clients in California. His out on all of this has been like, I'm too old to understand the proceedings against me. The bar for competency is very low. Do you understand the proceedings? Can you help your attorneys? Like, are you engaged in what's going on? There are some people who are not competent in that way due to mental disease or defect. That can happen. But when it truly happens, it's people who who truly are not dealing based in reality and do not understand what is happening. So it's different than like pleading insanity. It's different than those things. And so they get evaluated for competency and the court decides if someone's competent or not. And that can change throughout a proceeding. Somebody can come in being competent, be not found not competent for a period, be restored to competency with medical intervention or medication. So this can fluctuate. They had a massive hearing on Tom. And I think part of that's because of his age and he's in a conservatorship. So does he really know what's happening or does he not? And a big part of this was during 
the hearing, the prosecutor was asking about his fraud and his response at counsel table under his breath was, fuck you. He was so, it seems, angry about what was being asked, but the anger wasn't a random response. He he wasn't like, oh my God, hey, Jan. Like he wasn't responding to things that weren't there or weren't true. It was a logical response to what was being asked. It's inappropriate to say that in court, but it was a logical response to what was being asked. It was an emotional outburst, if you will, but it shows that he knows exactly what's happening. He knows exactly what's being said and it made him mad. So it it absolutely played against him and the judge brought it up in the order. It was a very thorough order. And the judge said that Tom Girardi's faking. The judge said he's malingering. And the judge said that the prosecution's argument that he's exaggerating his symptoms and faking was persuasive. Oh my God, Yana. Oh. The okay. internet has been asking this since the day Tom Girardi went into that conservatorship. The internet's like faking, faking, faker. And I mean, I thought it was the perfect crime. Years later, the judge is like, yeah, faking, faking, faker. He's he's exaggerating and malingering. You know what came up over and over and over again in the judge's ruling? What? The car accident. Uh, the, 2017, the 2017 car accident off a cliff where he broke his ankle, not the snowing in Pasadena. That came up too. It was so fun having the context from watching the show because the judge is like, he confronted burglars, but he's on body camera from the police after the burglary walking through the house explaining to them what might be missing and stuff so the body worn camera footage is something the judge reviewed to show that in 2020 when that happened it was snowing in pasadena and he had to have surgery on his eye and and so yeah i'm a little bit stressed that whole situation the body worn camera where tom was talking the police through what happened with the break-in came back to show that he was doing okay okay yeah so the car accident and the, he confronted burglaries. He needed surgery on his eye. That whole situation it all came up. Wait a minute, wait a minute. Before I ask my next question, um, Tina Ball 7, thank you so much for the super sticker. We appreciate you. We love you, whether you're from the Adams family or law nerd community, thank you for being here. My next question is, if you commit a crime, it can't be like, you can't commit an act of violence and then be like, I don't know, but it can be- You can. Oh, you can, that can absolutely happen. There, there are, and I am not a psychiatrist, psychologist, medical professional, but there are people with different levels of, of very serious mental disorders where sometimes those acts of violence are not what they think is happening. Like it's, they are not functioning in reality. So there are those that commit crime and it is more rare. There are those that commit crime that are not competent to stand trial and those they don't just get out they are generally treated in locked facilities but that's a whole a whole separate world but there is absolutely a world where people um are not operating in reality in a way where they can be punished um or have diminished iq in a way where they are not punished in the same way because the constitution guarantees you the right to a fair trial the right to confront and cross-examine witnesses and there is a degree of competency where you're not actually getting a, a fair trial if you cannot participate in that process due to mental disease or defect. There's a lot of nuance to that. And you see crimes where people do stuff that you're like, you have got to be joking me. Like the, um, if for anyone that followed the Taylor Shabizness business case, it was a case out of uh, Wisconsin. She was getting intimate with a the dude. They were both using meth she started choking him as part of that intimacy and then just kept going and was like sweet this sounds great um but then like completely dismembered him and was oh trying God. to hide the body and stuff so it's a heinous horrendous crime that most people wouldn't do but she wasn't incompetent to stand trial she was uh there were issues but she knew what she was doing she did not know what she was doing when she was doing the crime though so there are people who commit crimes that do not know what they are doing and that's different okay so as we wrap up tom girardi <laughs> and all of this because you have my mind like see are we going i'm like i'm a little boggled but also like i feel like i could just sit here and talk to you for no, hours criminal competency is not like a quote unquote get out of jail free card it's it's a constitutional protection like what um is that is this fair to try this person for this crime and as i said it is a very very low bar and it can shift um 
So somebody might be not competent to stand trial. They might be sent out for mental health, mental health treatment and then be on medication and antipsychotic medication and then be competent to stand trial. So it can be restored. It's a whole, it's a whole area of criminal law because unfortunately this is, I, I don't want to soapbox on your channel, but the, the systems to support mental health in our country don't always do that well and aren't always accessible well. And so a lot of those issues overlap with our criminal justice system. And then there's, there's um, overlap where the criminal justice system is trying to deal with what a functioning mental health system should be dealing with. So Tom Girardi is not that person. <laughs> with all of this and the knowledge that you have, do you feel like Tom will eventually end up in prison? Like, is there a good, because I used to ask you for those people who are watching right now, like, after I did my Jen Shaw interview, I would call Emily a lot and ask, like, what is the legal of it? What do you think? Because I'm hearing one thing. Do you think that there's any merit to the one thing that I'm hearing? Or do you think another thing? And she would pretty much give it to me like, Adam, this is what it looks like. I don't know. I'm not a part of it. But this is what it looks like. And eventually, that's exactly what it became. So... The With court that. documents are so different. I'm sorry that I cut off your question. The court no. documents are so different than talking to a person. Because Jen, I mean, I met Jen just briefly at BravoCon, but watching Jen on television, Jen is tremendously charismatic. Um, she is immensely convincing. People want to not just uh, um, please her, but be around her. She She pulls people into orbit. Fraud defendants are so typically incredibly charming. Um, it's how people want to do things for them and override their red flags that they have about something. They're like, she would never do that to me. She's just so great. And you see the women on Salt Lake getting kind of bowled over by Jen's personality and are dealing with it this season in hindsight being like, did I just totally play into it? And the answer is yes, because she's charming and because you wanted to believe her and because she's your friend and because she said they're just persecuting her and people wanted to believe her. They didn't want to believe that they had not seen that she was actually um, doing things that were fraudulent. And they don't, people don't want to believe that they can be fooled. We're humans. We're so easily fooled because we want to trust people and we want to believe the best in people, especially people who are our friends. And that gets, that's where the fraud defendants come in and take advantage. And that's why fraud crimes can be so hard to recover from as a victim because it kind of shakes your trust in other people and in yourself. And that's that's where it's really hard. I feel like I'm a gullible victim of a fraud committer because I lead with like my heart and emotion and I'm like, "Oh my god, you're so nice. You're so nice to me." And then like I get emotional about it and then I'm like, "You just rammed me in the AWS with whatever BS that you were giving me and what the are we doing at this point? And then I come to find out that like, and Jason's like, Jason will just say to me, he's like, don't even bring this to my table at this point. I told you, you don't listen to me. You call Emily, you call anybody else you want to call. I don't want to talk about it. And I'm like, okay, fair. But, um, Murray, Adam and Emily, in case you were wondering what is up with the hat icon, we are trying to find one to represent. Oh, thank you guys. Thank you so much. We love you, Murray. Um, I, you know what Adam Adam's emoji in my phone is? It's the big emoji smiley face with star eyes. Hey, <laughs> I like that. Adam is a star in my eyes, so it's a big. It's the big star eyes. So I, that's the emoji I use for Adam in my phone. <laughs> I love you, Emily. Um, my, I guess before again before we move on because we've spent thirty minutes on this. Do you think, in fact, Wait, that there is time limit, Adam? Uh huh. <laughs> We have a time limit? Do we have a time limit? Uh, I am going through your people, okay? <laughs> your people gave me a time limit. So, yes, we do. We have a we have a time limit. We'll be good. We'll be good. <laughs> okay, so my question was, for Tom Girardi, do you think that – what do you think – are we leaning on the scale? Like, if the scale is tipping one way or another – do you think that we're leaning towards like eventually he will be in prison or he could get out of this? I mean, he might die. If he doesn't die. If he doesn't die. So um, I don't know how Tom Girardi gets out of this because so much of it's already been proven. There's, there's very few criminal cases where you're going in and it's already been proven in civil court. 
normally the criminal cases go first and then civil cases resolve after the criminal case. This one has been backwards. Like in the Lion Air case, it's already been proven that the clients didn't get their money. Like that's a fact. That's a crime. So now the crime becomes just a, you have to prove it one way or the other. It's just, you have to prove it one way or the other. He is going to be convicted on some of these charges. They've already been proven unless he takes a plea deal. And even if he takes a plea deal, he's admitting to guilt. So yes, there's a very real possibility he goes to prison here. Um, I don't, I don't know how he gets around that given the amount of money taken, the breaches of trust that are so egregious, but they're going to argue based on his age, he should be allowed to be on, you know, probation or house arrest in a, in a, uh, facility and stuff like that. So could there be for health reasons, a circumstance where he's convicted and on probation? I mean, it would be so unusual, but things can happen based on his age. But I mean, they put Phil Spector right in prison. They were just like, do not pass code, do not connect to under, collect $200. They're like, we, you know, your health issues aside, go to jail. Um, if there's somebody like his age, would they put him in gin pop? Oh, the, the way that they determine where people are housed and medically housed, he would, he would be medically housed likely just Got based on his age. But that's, he would be going through federal prison, so even though we're hearing from Todd Chrisley that that's been a horrific experience for him. There are medical uh, federal prison facilities, so he would likely be in a medical facility. Now, but it just depends. before we get to the Todd Chrisley of it all, since we're on the Bravo spectrum here. Yeah, before we switch networks. <laughs> before we switch networks, yes. Not change the channel yet. Um, It just got so dark in here. I'm like, what's going Same. on? Same. It is Stormy. It is dark. I think it's storming. Mm -hmm. It's just across the nation, you guys, because we're nowhere near close to each other, which I wish we were, but we are not. Um, <laughs> You're going to be in one of my favorite cities soon, and it's it's going to be great. Well, I have to tell you really quick, and this is so off topic because I feel like that's exactly what we do. Jason is bouncing back and forth between where we are now and that location mm -hmm. and he's like, you know, but like right now, Adam, you can't drive. I said, I drive every day. He's like, no, but you're shit at it. And I, was like, <laughs> I was like, that's fair. And All he's I like, point to yes, Adam is ADHD. It's yeah. like, that it is. it's like, cause you get distracted. <laughs> I get distracted. And he's like, he's like, you know, he's like, and they are like, the neighborhoods are like suburban. And I was like, that sounds so nice. And he's like, no, like I'm saying like kids are riding around on bicycles. And I was like, like yeah. <laughs> you have to pay what attention. do you mean? <laughs> and he's like, there's like kids, they play out in the road. And I'm like, oh no, I don't know. I don't know I about that. Drive. I'm not going to drive. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I don't think so. Maybe that is not the right place for me, but we're going to take a look. But it's with walkable. that, guys, it's walkable. It's walkable. Speaking of um, a not suburban area, would Valley Village be suburban? It's Maybe the it valley. Is, is that suburban? Oh, it's, just, it's the burbs. It's, it's the valley. <laughs> is it still, though, like considered the valley? I mean, I think so, but I, but I mean, you're Valley like an LA native. native. You're like one of the few. Up. It's like, it's, it's new. It's so funny to me because Brian was watching Beverly Hills with me last night and he doesn't always, but he sometimes does. Cause now he's invested in like the esophagus of it all because he is a <laughs> maclofacial prostodontist. So this is like his part of the body and he has all of the thoughts about it. So we were watching Real House. He's like, oh, Sutton got a second date. Like he's now rooting for Sutton. It's so funny to watch to watch Beverly Hills with him. But he's just like, Dorit's house is lovely. I'm like, it's in Encino. He's like, that's that's not even like Los Angeles. What is happening? I'm like, no, none of the Beverly Hills housewives seem to actually live in Beverly Hills at this point. They're like Pasadena, you know, and Sino, they're all over the place. It's not a lot of people who actually live in Beverly Hills, which is why they're all schlepping all over Los Angeles in like Uber blacks to to see each other with drivers because they all live so dispersed. It's not it's not like Orange County was when it started with them all behind the gates when they were actually neighbors. They're not actually neighbors like well, any of them. While we're talking about this, do you think that Kyle Richards and Morgan Wade are secretly in a relationship that they're trying to hide at this point by watching that episode? Because they're now adorable Morgan... together. They're what? They're adorable together. But do you think it's a friendship or do you in your bones feel like mm, there could potentially be more to this and that's okay? 
I think there could potentially be more to it and that's okay. I'm always uncomfortable speculating on people's relationships, but then again, my like bestie bestie of the world, whenever uh, Judge Abby and I are out together, people assume that we're a lesbian couple and we're totally fine with that. So it, there are times where female friendships can be very, very close, but not romantically close. So there's like, I, I don't, I don't know. I think it could be. She, she lights up when she sees Morgan. Um, yeah. It was very telling to me that her husband was not there for her best friend's celebration of life and that Morgan was the person she was leaning on. Like Teddy and her birthday. Yeah, Teddy they showed know. up in the car and then was like off and away. But Morgan in that moment was clearly her person. Morgan was the one sitting there being her rock. They were the ones sharing food. Like whether they're they're romantically involved or not, it's very clear that Morgan is like her ride or die. Um, so. You know what though? I, I get that what you're saying about the judge and stuff too, because sometimes I go out with Jason and people automatically assume that he's gay and that we're together. And sometimes that throws me off and I'm like, <laughs> don't do that you you assume my husband is gay <laughs> don't assume my husband is my husband <laughs> for you i love i i think it's always funny when people assume judge abby and i are a couple but we are we have been close friends for that long um and and we are tremendously close i wonder what people think when like it's her and me and brian because like do people just assume that we're just you know polyamorous yeah we're just sister wives though if i was going to sister wife with anyone it would totally be judge abby um we could have won this shit. are you allowed to say this <laughs> <laughs> we've okay. been friends for that long but people sometimes are like you guys are just the most adorable couple and we're like thank you we yeah and and you know we're i also grew up in a generation where most of my female friends and i refer to each other as girlfriends and now it gets confusing for people it's like oh no my girlfriend blah 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 and they're like like romantic partner or like friend who is a girl. And I'm like, when did this get confusing? Yeah, <laughs> so, you're like, it's not supposed to be this way. Just like my friends. Um, so I don't really, I don't really know. I'm happy for Kyle either way. She was very pointed at the end of the episode when she's like, life is too short and I don't have time for, um, for people who don't appreciate me. And I know that you've had substantial loss in your life. I've had substantial loss in my life. It really makes you reevaluate your life. Mm -hmm. And I think that that was a cracking point for Kyle of like, am I going to live my life from this point forward with things that aren't serving me? And I think the answer to that for her is no. Um, yeah. She also grew up in a generation where women being bi was not really a thing that, that was um, easy to do. So I think she might, if she is experiencing that, she might be like, what else have I been suppressing in my life? Like, where else am I not fulfilled? And now you're in a time where we have the whole freaking street painted like yeah, a rainbow and we're celebrating it. available to you. Go for it, girl. No one's judging. So Take I'm, it all the way. I'm hesitant to speculate for her, though the times that she, she was like, no, let's discuss scissoring. I'm like, this is too much. Okay. <laughs> like. This okay, is, Kyle, you're you getting really Kyle. excited. Kyle's like, let's play into all the rumors. And I'm like, <sighs> okay. And that's the only thing, before we get into Tom and Ariana, that's the only thing that for me, I agree with Zari. It's like, these are this is how rumors get started. Like the music videos, the traveling. Mauricio is not at your 50 whatever birthday, which she looks 40 still to me in Mexico. And Morgan Wade is, you're feeding her. You stop like... The event planner and everything because she starts singing and you're mesmerized and i'm like yeah kyle was staring at morgan wade as if she were dave matthews and i i felt her in that moment i'm like i get it i get it like i get it i get it i get it that's how i am about dave um but yeah she did she was like i i can't she was she was just she's mesmerized. very very into morgan and that's okay and we love I'm really, I really love the Morgan edition of it all to the show. I love it. I love I love it. I absolutely love it. Morgan reminds me of my little small hometown in Sequatchie County, Tennessee, when she's like, you know, Kyle, I think it's funny because you don't like the cantaloupe and I'll eat the cantaloupe. And I'm like, how do you know she doesn't like cantaloupe? You guys are really freaking close. And she's like, I'll feed you the cantaloupe. And then Dorit's over here like. Dorit's offended. And Kyle's like, it might be Taco Tuesday every day. So get out, get, get over it, Dorit. Um, Ooh. I think Dorit's hurt that Kyle's not as close to Dorit as Kyle is to Morgan. Kyle and Morgan have a clearly very, very close friendship, whether that's more than a friendship, whatever.
but they're clearly close. And I think Dorit's a little jealous because Kyle was her friend. And I wonder if Dorit thought this season with Lisa not being there, that it would be like her time to be the bestie. I think also though with Dorit just in guys, we're bouncing all over right now, but I think with Dorit too, I think that Kyle sees her speculation on the relationship with her and Morgan and Kyle doesn't want to even deal with that. She just wants to embrace whatever really, whether it's a friendship or anything more or whatever she wants to be in that moment. She doesn't want to have to explain like, okay, well, this looks like something to you. I don't care. I think she's in her, I don't care phase. And I think that Dorit is so used to seeing Kyle with, it's like divorce. It's like when a married couple gets a divorce and it's so hard for, you to go out with your new partner with the former couple that you used to go out with because now they're looking at your new partner and they're not used to them. And I think that Kyle looks at her like as an attachment, her and PK as an attachment to her relationship with Mauricio. And that is no longer a thing. So I think with Morgan, she's now re-embracing her relationship with her sisters and other friends who have been there for her. And I think that as of right now, and I'm not saying for forever, I think that Dorit doesn't really have a place in that that makes Kyle feel comfortable. I agree with you. And I think like Dorit went through a major trauma too with her break in and she is trying to lean on PK about that. How much PK is leaning back in, I'm unclear on, but Kyle also had a major trauma with losing her friend and is leaning into her friend group and leaning into the relationships that matter to her. And it seems that that's leaning away from Mauricio and leaning into her sisters and her family and leaning into life is too short and I, I don't need a man. And I get that. Whether she's in a relationship with a woman or not is kind of irrelevant to the I don't need a man feelings. <laughs> so her kids are, are growing up. She doesn't have young kids. And she's getting this second phase of life that she can really embrace at 50 and be like, I've built a career. I've built my family. My kids are good. And it's time for me to be good and live my life. I'm here if, for it. I'm loving Kyle this season. If I ever feel disconnected from Jason and he pisses me off, I'm going to be like, screw you. I'm going to go find a woman. You're like, I don't need a man. I don't need a man. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay. So wait, now I have to get into this really quick because as we know, and we're about to see her next Wednesday night, Ariana Maddox has been sort of the rising star of Bravo, right? She has done Dancing with the Stars. She made it into the finals. Um, she is now about to be on Chicago as Roxy. She booked so many different sponsorships and promotional ads. She I loved all of my Get Your Bag. I loved the tie-ins with like the pens and the toilet paper. Like I loved the lean in on all things Ariana. I loved it. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and the pink garbage bags. Yeah. I loved, I loved all of it. I loved that the brands were being cheeky. Of course, everybody wants to be part of a viral moment. I think some brands did that better than others, but it was fun to watch. Like, I just imagined all of like the delightful Bravo gays in marketing just being like, now is our time. Yeah. Strike while the iron is hot. We can get this company to do this fun thing. Let's do it. And I love it. I loved it. You know what's so funny is I saw a comment the other day and I, I try to be I try to kind of not be biased, which sometimes with like, and you know, like going to BravoCon and stuff and having the, the relationships, sometimes I want to defend and I'm like, I can't, I got to step out. But even for Ariana, I saw a comment the other day where somebody said, Adam, you don't understand, like she's fame hungry and this and this. And I'm like, you really don't know her because let me tell you, this girl out of the entire cast probably has the best head on her shoulders in the sense that she's like, this is a moment. This is not real life right now. Maybe it's real, whatever. But eventually she just wants a white picket fence in a suburban home, not in California, out in the middle of nowhere. She doesn't want this. This is what Kyle I, does too, actually. Yeah, I mean, and, and that's what she wants. But now... What I wanted to ask you is we have this situation with this $2 million home and now I'm sure it's worth a lot more than 2 million. It's about 4,500 square feet. The house is massive, been in the house. It's pretty big. I mean, 4,500 square feet is not your everyday average LA home, home not homeowners not, sure home. not in LA. or yeah. even LA, like, but even for just a homeowner across America, yeah. 4,500 square feet is a big home. It is a big yeah. home, especially for two people and two dogs and a cat. It's a big home, right? So yeah. 
Now she wants out of it. And what we found out was that he wants to stay in the home and him and his attorney, they ended up giving her an offer. She thought the offer was garbage or shit or whatever she called it. And she's like, absolutely not. My attorney is going to deal with this. So now I read about this, but there were two situations that we have moving forward that the judge can decide on. And that's kind of what I wanted to pick your brain on is because we have two separate homeowners and they're not married, but they own the same home. What does this look like? They each own 50% of the home. And in practicality, Ariana can't just sell 50% of a home. Though I did suggest, this is my solution, sell it to Schwartz. Like Ariana, sell your 50% to Schwartz, let Schwartz move in with Sandoval and just be. I don't think that she wants, I think that I in her mind, she's it. like, I don't want bitches in my house. I think she looks at it like that. Like, no, I don't know. I think it's at the end of the day, if she wants out, it comes down to, it needs to be the market value of the home and she needs to take out of it. What, what she, what she put into it, plus the equity she's earned. There's some complications in that. If Tom, did take out a line of credit against the equity to open Tom Tom, um, and that apportions to his fifty percent. But they each own half of a house as you know tenants. A lot of time when you buy a house and you're married, two people own the home, but they each own a hundred percent of it. They each own fifty percent of the house. Right. But with a residential property, you can't really just sell fifty percent of a house. So if they can't come to an agreement on how much somebody needs to buy the other person out for, it has to be forced to be sold. And the only way to do that is through court process and probably mediation. So that's what she sued for because there's no, excuse me, there's no divorce process to handle this because they're not married in that way, um, even though they were together for 10 years or more. So she filed this lawsuit to allow the court to facilitate the sale of the home. So it's an equitable division of the asset. Can this go any other way but that? I mean, the court could say no, but it's unlikely. It's probably going to go to mediation and the lawyers will deal with it. So the judge can force the sale of the home like he did with the Zolciak Beerman crew. Can absolutely, yeah, they can absolutely force it. It will probably go to mediation. Um, okay. And then there will be somebody in charge of it. But yes, the judge can force the sale of the home. Okay. And now for him and her because he took out a substantial amount of money from the sale or, or from the the amount that the home was the worth, equity. the equity in the home. Yeah. Um, and he used that for his Schwartz and Sandy's bar. I think it was like something to the effect of $200,000. So let's say that they sell the home and in profits, they have $1 million and they both get 500. Now, does that extra two hundred thousand go to her, and she gets seven hundred, and he gets three hundred? It wouldn't necessarily go to her. It just wouldn't diminish her portion. Okay. So, if there's a million dollars in profit, and they split it five hundred thousand each, Tom has to pay the two hundred thousand dollar loan back, and Ariana doesn't. So he gets the diminished amount because he has to pay back his loan. And she is like, I'm, I'm not on me. That's on your part of the equity. Hopefully it's not, the loan is not for more than 50% of the equity. It If the loan is for 50% of the equity, then Tom walks away with nothing and the loan paid off and she walks away with whatever profit there is. But the loan will be paid out of his portion if it was his loan. Which is so wild because I was talking to Jason about this and she actually went to college for musical theater where I grew up and now she's doing Chicago and Jason made a great point. Her boyfriend, Dan lives in New York and she's doing Chicago. If she kills it in Chicago, she will probably have a whole career outside of Vanderpump rules and Broadway. Go, her. Go get it. Theater. babe. Go get it. I, I've seen the comments too, that people are like, Ariana is just, doing this or that. I mean, everybody's like, oh, everybody wants to be famous. I'm like, I don't, I don't know that Ariana really wants to be famous. I think she wanted opportunities for sure when she went on the show, but I think this happened, like Scandaval happened. It wasn't going to diminish. She was thrust into this thing through no action of her own other than dating someone who she had trusted, who, um, who cheated on her. So I, I see it more as a make lemonade out of lemons kind of situation. And 
And this was all going to happen anyway. Like brands were going to do ad campaigns playing on the attention of Scandaval, whether she was getting paid for that or not. All of it was going to happen. So why not also get your bag? I have no, no issues with that at all. I think it was a tremendously smart thing to do. I think it is too. And I think that if anybody's going to be okay, you know, what's so funny is obviously, you know, like, and it's, it's funny because you had a conversation. I don't know if it was with Jason or who it was with, but it was at BravoCon. And it's the way that sometimes I sit there and like, I just get like down to like the grit with some of these Bravo liberties. And I'm just like, I sit there and I, I say whatever I want sometimes. And I'm like, Oh, maybe I shouldn't have, but that's why I bond with them because I'm not treating them as like, I'm a fan. And with her, I'm sitting here looking at it like, this is amazing. You have seized all of the opportunities. Yep. And now you're you're making anywhere from seventy to ninety thousand dollars a social media post. You're getting all of these promotional ads, sponsorships, whatever. And then more and more companies are coming forward for right. you. And it's just like, why would you not? There's no reason to put yourself on a show like this to not do that. And right. talking to some of my friends who are on the show, they are really genuinely worried that, God forbid, this is the last season, season 11 or whatever. They've yeah. been thinking it's the last season for multiple seasons. But if this is the last season, what do we do moving forward? Like we're used to, I have one friend who wants to do e-news. That's not going to make you a lot of money not what you're making on the show that you're making now, you're going to make under six figures as an entry level E news correspondent. And right now you're making anywhere from 500 to $900,000 a year. I mean, you get taxed on it, but you're still making it. Yep. So it, it just makes me like, they all have a podcast. <laughs> right. I'm surprised more of them don't lean more heavily into YouTube, um, which is more lucrative than podcasting, but you know, yeah. Yeah, but it does make me think about it because I'm like, before I always thought, before she was canceled, I always thought that Stassi with her live shows and everything, she was gearing up for a talk show. And then of course we know she was canceled. And after that, I was like, well, Lala had the backing of Randall before all of that happened. And I thought maybe she would be the next one. And now when I'm really looking at the longevity of any sort of career and anybody who might be able to make it outside of the reality TV Vanderpump rules of it all, and it's not because of the opportunities that she's had so far, but it's because of what she's done with these opportunities. I'm like, oh, Ariana might be the one who, after this, she's like, I'm okay. Yeah, I'm good. Bye. And she also is setting herself up to be in a position where if it is not um, good for her to have to film with Tom, she can walk away. She's secured herself in a place where if she needs to walk away, she probably can. And I think that's a very empowering place to be in as opposed to, I still have to go to work every day and look at my ex who did all this awful shit to me. It's nice to be able to close the door and move on from it when it's time to move on instead of like circling in it. But can I ask you a real, like a real, real question? Yeah, yeah, yeah. On Bravo, why is it always Tom's? It's always Tom's. On Real Housewives of New Jersey, there's a Tom. And in Beverly Hills, it's Tom. In Vanderpump Rules, it's Tom. Why is it always fucking Tom? I don't know because I said this to Jason. Jason and I made a pact. He said, going into 2024, this is the year and era of Jason. And I was like, no, bitch. It's the year and era of Adam. And he's like, no, it's not. It's Jason. So if it's not a Jason or an Adam, this year, as far as like the guys go, I don't care about the Toms. These Toms are causing trouble. I'm so over the Toms. These Toms are ridiculous. Unless you're Harry Dubin on The Real Housewives of <laughs> New York. Harry's not a Tom. <laughs> yeah, you're not a Tom. But, you know, it, it is it is kind of wild to see. And, you know, like, honestly, great for her. And I think that it's going to be incredible. And also, I don't know if you know this, but just you made a great point that she has put herself in a position to not have to film with Tom Sandoval. And they tried to put her in a position last year at the finale at that gold party which i know that you know about completely separately um but they tried putting her in a position where they wanted her to walk outside and film with another cast member and they tried blindsiding her with tom and she literally she was there with her guy and she said absolutely not and she walked out got up walked out told production unmike me 
I'm done. And what she, are you going to do, do to her? What are you going to do? You're going to fire me? Fine, fire me. I'll be on the She bye. knows. Yep. I don't even think she cares. I think that she just knows and doesn't care. I don't think it's about the money for her. I think it's the girl has a moral compass. You know what I mean? Yeah. And it's hard on reality TV, I think, sometimes to stand up for yourself if you're worrying about getting the next contract. I don't think Ariana's worried about getting the next contract. I think she's in a position where she's like, I can live where I'm at. And you don't need fuck you money to be okay being like, I'm good where I'm at. It's it's one of the things I love most about being a YouTube creator because when there are opportunities that come my way and I'm like, that's a lot of my time and not a lot of compensation and you're taking me away from my community and my family. And if you're gonna take me away from those two things, then there needs to be a reason for me to do it. And it's really nice to be able to say like, I'm like, I'm good. Like I'm yeah. good, I don't, I don't need to do that, but we can make it work for me. I filmed something that'll be coming out next month and we were going back and forth. I'm like, truly, I want to be involved, but I do not have this chunk of time to fly here or there and everywhere. They came to Nashville and filmed with me for a day. Am I, I like, featured oh, in that? Is that the thing that we talked about? It is the thing that we talked about. Okay. Yay. So I love doing things with you, even if we're not together. But I <laughs> love being able to say, I would love to, I would love to be a part of this, but it only works for me if we do it this way. And they're like, we'll make it work and we'll come to you. Great. Then I'm happy to participate. So yeah. it's nice to be in a position where you can. Well, you're a boss. Ass, and I think that that's different. Like, I don't know about that, but I, I can set boundaries because again, I love being with my community and my family. And if you're going to take me away from those things where I could be doing other stuff, it needs to be worth it for me. Sometimes things like the Vanderpump Rules premiere, worth it, going to be fun as hell. I get to hang out with you. Like there's a fun quotient where I'm like, it doesn't matter if it makes sense, it's worth it because it's fun. But there's there's room to just to just say no. And I think Ariana's put herself in a good position and she's not trying to hold on to the show if it's time to move on from it. I think Lala's in a good position to do that too. It would be interesting to see how the others are. You know what's so funny I just realized about you is you are EDB. Mm -hmm. I'm ADHD. <laughs> but you are EDB. And, and ADHD. If you, <laughs> if you take the B and put it in front of the... Adam, I'm also dyslexic. ADHD. What are you doing to me? <laughs> I'm saying you went from Emily D. Baker to Big Dick Energy. Because that's what I, <laughs> oh, that's the EDB that EDB. I get off of you. You're like, no, you're coming to me and it's going to be worth my time. And I love that about you. So you went from <laughs> EDB to BDE. We're going to end up with merch that says EDB or <laughs> BDE. Yes. All right. So guys, I, I had I that Big Dick Energy. Adam, I played on a men's water polo team. That's like where I came up from. Like you, sometimes you just... <laughs> <laughs> you just need it. It's maybe it's the prosecutor in me, but sometimes it's just it's there. I really um, we still haven't even talked about, about the Chrisleys. Wait, Chat let's bring up the Chrisleys really quick because I wanted to ask you what does this mean for us watching the Chrisleys? Because you said, and I'm gonna give everyone a little bit of context real quick. Yeah, so let's when do, I let's do a, like wrote a quick road so far. Yes. So way back when, when I was talking about Jen Shaw and anything that legal, I will shoot Emily a message or a call. And when she has time, she answers it. She's so amazing that way. I, I no. always answer eventually. <laughs> no, you do. You do. You're amazing in that way. And my thing is, is like with the Grizzlies, I, I asked you about the, the potential appeal that they might have. And you said, if anybody at a Jen Shaw, at a, cause Jen Shaw, obviously she, forego that right to be able to appeal but out of anybody that we've been talking about the Grizzlies would have the biggest chance now we haven't really talked about it since then but then we see that one arm of the government this arm this bitch over here has now given them a million dollars in a lawsuit where there was somebody who was going after them and they were able to prove that it was not for the right reasons and now their attorney Alex Little is arguing that the other arm this bitch over here is saying, we still want to keep you in prison. So now the attorney is arguing, how does one part extension of the government give just you a million dollars? They're looking good, Adam. Just come on. You want to share it? Just be like, yes. I'm passing. They're, they're looking great. Yes. Hey, thanks. <laughs> I'm just flexing on everyone right now. No, but <laughs> legitimately, I'm wondering the same thing that their attorney is wondering, how does one extension of the government give you a million dollars in a lawsuit and the other extension of the government is still keeping you in prison? I think it's a great question. The Chrisley stuff is so complex 
And the state level investigation is just that it's a state level tax investigation. Most states have both a state tax entity and then the federal tax entity for the international crew. If you're like, this sounds like the worst guessing game ever. It is because if you guess wrong, you can end up in jail. So the state entity is where they had a big win, but they were prosecuted by the federal government for federal tax stuff and bank stuff. The biggest two big problems for me with the Chrisley prosecution that is going to come up in their appeal. One of those is a Fourth Amendment search and seizure issue. And without taking everyone to law school, it's arguing that in the Georgia investigation, they got to certain evidence illegally. And the settlement seems to show us some of that. Mm -hmm. um, they got to this evidence illegally, but then it was used in the trial improperly. The to prevent the government from doing things illegally, there are rules. And if you get to evidence illegally or get to evidence A illegally and evidence A leads you to evidence B, you can't use any of it. Um, and that's like the fruit of the poisonous tree. You can't, if you get to this thing illegally, you can't get to any of it. So the argument is that the evidence used at trial is evidence that wasn't supposed to be used. It's a very good argument because a previous judge had ruled it couldn't come in and then this judge let it in. So there's a deeply legal search and seizure issue there that is strange. I'm like, how did this, e I still don't understand how it happened. Um, I would have to sit down with the, these defense attorneys and be like, I need you to explain to me because I've read all of these documents and I can't figure out how this judge was like, yeah, no problem. It's it's a huge problem. Yeah, and that's, I think the appellate court is gonna feel the same way when they read through the documents and be like, okay, but this is a huge problem. The other thing is there was some testimony that came in that wasn't exactly accurate from the IRS in the Chrisley prosecution which also doesn't sit well with me. Um, if the government's prosecuting you for stuff you did wrong, then then that's on you for doing the stuff wrong. But if they're using evidence that's illegally gotten and testimony that's not true, then that's on them. And that is where I think the appeal is very strong. And this win in Georgia can bolster that appeal because Georgia is kind of where the root of these investigations all came from. So. I guess my next question is, based off of everything that you just said, if they are having this conversation with the appellate court, right? Mm -hmm. Oh my God, I'm learning. She's legally blonde, we love it. Yes, in April, because Todd Crisley was a little bit annoyed that it got moved back from March to April. Yeah, they were having this conversation in April, could they potentially overturn their convictions? It won't probably happen in April, but they were granted oral argument, which is exceedingly rare at the appellate court level. So it's a very good sign that the appellate court isn't looking at this as like an open and shut kind of an appeal. A lot of the appeals you look at, um, you look at a case like Taylor's business, we were talking about the beheading and all of it. You look at that case, she is probably going to appeal. There's never going to be an oral argument. The appellate court's going to look at it and be like, this is all fine. And it's just going to go down, go down the road because the evidence was so overwhelming. Granting an oral argument is also a huge win because it shows that the appellate court wants to know more about this case. And what they probably want to know is how the fuck did any of this happen? Like, how did this evidence come in? And that's a huge deal for the Chrisleys because most appeals never get an oral argument. They read the record and they're like, nope, we're not overturning this. So if they were inclined to, if they, if they thought that this was a clear cut case, they wouldn't have granted an oral argument. So it's a very big deal. And they grant oral arguments on a very, very small percentage of cases in appellate courts. So that's a very good thing for the Chrisleys. How long will it take the judges to rule after that could be 90 days? Um, if they get a new trial, then there is going to be that window where the prosecution decides how they go forward. It's kind of hard to if then that because we don't know what the appellate court's going to do. But there's a possibility that the appellate court could say, you're right, overturn the conviction. The Chrisleys could stay in prison and the prosecution could say, fine, we're going to try them again. That could take a year plus. So the Chrisleys could stay in prison for almost the entirety of their prison term if they choose to re-prosecute. Of course, if they choose to not re-prosecute, they can just say, okay, um, you, you, we're not going to re-prosecute. We're going to dismiss the charges against you, and now you're free. And well, then if you're like, well, can't the Chrisleys sue for being held in custody and having their appeal overturned? No, no, they cannot. You literally just answered everything without me even <laughs> asking it. Because I was curious. I was like, so how long would that take? Oh, can they sue after? 
Oh, okay. Okay. So we're good. Yes. If the government gets it wrong in that way where um, they prosecute and an appeal gets overturned, there's very limited circumstances under which there could be a lawsuit. It would be, yeah, um, it's a bummer you were in federal prison. Sorry about that. You're out now. Be happy. Yeah. So they can't exactly. turn around and like try to get money out of it, which I actually would have assumed that they could have. But now it's like, well, you're not serving 12 years in prison. You served a year and a half, two years. So be grateful. Which is still, I mean, it's real interesting watching Savannah um, talk about this experience, talk about what she's learned from watching her parents go through it. It's It's interesting to watch it play out. You know, you never want to see people sit in prison um when they shouldn't be but we know that it happens all the time and it's opening more conversations about it and that's a good thing yeah definitely and they're also both two like um big advocates of everything happens for a reason and that this might be their journey that has been given to them from the lord so it, they they seem to have had a very um things happen for a reason it's going to work out and i imagine that faith is helping them not feel um like they are just like the entire world's collapsing in on them and that that's very much um supporting their family through it savannah has taken on quite a tremendous amount of responsibility in her family with this and it, that's going to change her perspective on the world going forward and it's interesting to see yeah i'm no, like no. i mean i i i feel awful saying like it's interesting watching along, but this is playing out and it's interesting watching along. You know, you never, you never want somebody to sit in custody who, who is wrongfully convicted, but also they're very open and transparent about this journey. And I'm glad that they are. Have they had to pay any restitution so far? I have no idea if they've already paid restitution, but I will say I went over the settlement agreement document yesterday on my channel most of that settlement agreement went to pay legal fees okay so the lawyer the lawyers got the settlement most of it went to legal fees and other debts so they didn't like get a million dollars into their bank account it it paid other things got it because i was wondering if they paid restitution even though they can't sue the government or anybody for putting them in prison can they at least be refunded their restitution that they paid going into it the I don't even know if there was any restitution ordered because the taxes had been paid and I don't know if there were still outstanding debts to the banks that hadn't been taken care of in bankruptcy. So if there was restitution owed to specific individuals, like there was in an example where there were taxes still owed, you still owe those. So no, you're not going to get them back. But if they had to pay restitution into like a restitution fund, then that would be different. Um, the the Blake G. Shelton in the chat said that per the Chrisley's lawyer, the federal prosecutor quit. I'm very interested to learn more about that because it seemed that this prosecutor was very interested in this prosecution. And if that prosecutor is no longer there, another prosecutor might have a very different opinion. And that is something as a prosecutor that's different when you get a case file from a colleague and you're like, what in the world is this? So another prosecutor, if the appell appellate court goes their way, a different prosecutor might have a very different opinion on this case. And that would be interesting to see. Oof. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, Emily, they have, a good lasted, they have a good appeal. They do. You lasted 70 minutes with me. So just like that date bus thing on MTV, you can either take the $70 or you can go on a second date. <laughs> I feel like we covered so much, honestly, and you're so informative and everyone loves you. And especially like the law nerds joining us in the live chat today. It's always so much fun. And I just, I can't wait to see you again. I feel I like it's been wait so long and it you. hasn't. We, the chat has more questions. Do you have a minute? Can we ask a few more yeah. questions? No, yeah. No, I'm, I'm trying to be yeah. respectful of your time. No, we're, I don't have a hard out. We're good. We're Guys, good. We're good. Put, put a cue in front of the question. I can see the I can see some of them, but I saw like thoughts on Monica. Um, oh I yeah, please all of the thoughts on Monica. And here's the thing: I enjoyed seeing Monica at BravoCon as well. She's a stunning woman. She's fun to watch on TV. Yep. Like she's kind of delightful. Um, I watching the fallout of the reality of Auntie's of it all is very interesting. 
Monica took an approach to that that a lot of housewives don't. And she's like, yeah, that's mostly true. And what? And it's fascinating to see it play out. But also, Heather's more mad about an Instagram account than she is about Jen defrauding people. And that point resonates with me quite a lot. But also, Heather is still employing the same girl who was one of the six members of the Reality of Auntie's account, which I don't understand. And she's posting every single like day about Monica and tagging Heather in it. So, and she's still employed by Heather. So my question is, if you're taking such a hard stance and you want Monica to be fired, okay. But then why would you not fire your hairstylist? Because she was a part of it. That doesn't make any sense to me. I, I don't, I don't know either. Like if you're that mad at Monica, wouldn't you be mad at everyone who worked in the account? Like, I would be. It's it's an interesting thing. Um, Monica's great TV. I don't Monica's think that great, Monica's great TV. She's great TV. She's relatable. She brought life into this franchise. Um, I was also like all the rest of the women because Jen Shaw is still such a huge presence in this franchise, even though she's there. It's like the shadow of Jen Shaw over Real Housewives of Salt Lake City. And when Monica's in the room, they actually have conversations that aren't centered around Jen. But even Monica coming in. The, the first time we saw Monica was at a confessional being like, and that's how I became a witness for the federal government. I'm like, I am invested. I but am invested. For Monica too, you know what I, what I gathered from watching the show was I felt like the other women came in with a, a pact of even seeing them before they went onto the reunion floor and they, they like um, prayed together and all of the things. I was like, I feel like you guys came in with a pact to – slightly go in on each other but also have each other's backs and she was left on an island alone which in housewives world that's great reality tv because we want to see her fight back and then when she looks at andy father bravo over here and he's like how did you get cast and she's like because i messaged the casting department and i said that your ratings are shit and your cast sucks and you guys need to mix this up i'm like girl to have the goal to be able to do that in the balls I was like, she's just saying it. She's just saying it how it is. And I, I love to see it. But even at BravoCon, you could see the divide with the cast. You could see that there was a click and that Monica was on the outside of the click. So many of us have had that experience in our actual life or junior high that I don't know. I'm kind of rooting. I'm rooting for Monica because we can see it. Like there's times that they're clicking up and trying to exclude her to the outside. And I'm like, stop it. Stop well, it. But also you saw at the at that that party that we went to, which was so funny because you guys don't know the backstory, but we were trying to get up the elevator and Crystal Kung Minkoff came off the elevator, saw Emily, was so starstruck by her, led us back onto the elevator because she needed to, oh, absolute delight. She absolute was amazing. Delight. Mm -hmm. And we ended up, or maybe that wasn't the same night. I don't know. Night. It was a different night. There were so many different nights, but when we went up there, I got ambushed by the rest of the Salt Lake City crew. And then I went over and I sat down to Monica, like next to Monica. And I said, hi, I just want to introduce myself. And she's like, up and Adam, I know you. She's like, I thought you hated me. And I was like, hated you? Why would you think that? And she's like, because you interviewed Jen Shaw. And then Emily sits right next to me. And then we just had a full on <laughs> power conversation. Great conversation. Yeah, it was a great conversation. But KRH, thank you for the super sticker. We are super chat. We appreciate you. Could they not sue over the judge allowing the evidence of the poisonous tree or IRS perjury? It appears so messed up. The judges have immunity for decisions that they make on the bench. The way that you right a wrong with a federal judge is the appellate court saying, bad judge. And then they overturn them and that's it. So no, they can't. They're, they can't. Um, with the IRS stuff, perjury is not always prosecuted and difficult to prosecute, but they cannot sue over it. Um, because again, prosecutors have immunity based on their job. I also saw Mustang Mickey ask, will the Girardi case be refiled in LA? The Illinois case is going to go forward in Illinois because that's where the jurisdiction is. So they're not going to combine those prosecutions. So no, but the competency, I don't think is going to be tried in Illinois. I don't think they're going to go that route. Okay. So the competency is not going to be tried in Illinois. We think I don't that think so. I mean, that defense attorney could try to say, I have a concern as to his competency. And the Illinois judge is going to be like, CEG, the California judge, don't try this shit with me. And then we also think that Ariana is going to win. But then also we feel well, like I think the house is going to get sold. I mean, the house is going to get sold. And then we think that the Grizzlies have 
a very yeah, fair fine. shot, like a promising shot at this. And you're also saying that you think that Monica should be back for a second season. I absolutely do. Um, and with saying that Chrisleys have a shot, look, appeals out of the gate are for losers and most of them lose. Having a shot at an appeal is a, a unusual circumstance. Getting an oral argument is an unusual circumstance. Things are going in a good direction for them. Does that mean they will win at the end of the day? No. Do they have a, a good chance that people are going to hear out their full case and consider it fully? Yes, better than most. So that's where we are with that. Oof. But yeah, I want to see Monica back, don't you? Like, I, I don't want to see Heather and Whitney just fighting with each other again over who's more Mormon or, or not, or fighting with Lisa Barlow over whether his son's going to or not going to do a mission. Like, at some point, there need to be some other conversations on this show that don't center around old fights and Jen Shaw. Like, it's time to move on. And Monica pushed them all forward. Um, she was really relatable to the audience. The The relationship with her mother is wild to watch play out on tv and she's like i don't feel like i fit in with these women and i went and bought a bag and i'm like i get it you worked as the assistant and now you're like working your way up but you know kim kardashian was paris hilton's assistant so i can see where monica's like i see the career trajectory and also to be fair too with her i think that it keeps the conversation moving and i also think that she triggers these women and yeah. I think that she she makes them want to fight back. And I think without them, we watched last season when we had Meredith, Lisa Barlow, Heather Gay, and Whitney Rose because Jen Shaw refused to go to the um, reunion. And I think that I think that it just makes for more interesting TV. And I think that even though they want to push her out and bring in new people, it's like I don't want to get to know somebody new right now. I want to see how this story continues to unfold. Are we going to have? some sort of evolution in Monica's storyline? Is she going to be able to now come in and say, you know what, I did that, I effed up, I'm sorry, I've owned a lot of my shit. This was one thing I should have been a little bit more upfront about. I wanna see some sort of evolution. I don't wanna see just Monica disappear. I don't I don't understand yeah, I agree. That. I absolutely agree. Um, but we're also seeing like an era of reality TV that's an interesting conundrum for casting of people who are kind of gunning to get on these shows and strategizing relationships to get on the show. And that's something they're going to have to contend with. It doesn't mean she doesn't make good TV. She makes good TV, but we're in this like quasi reality TV at this point where people are trying to run their own storylines and production and people are now performing for the cameras and it's not as real um, as it used to be. It's not a slice of life. And social media informs some of that too. Um, but Monica has put, I think, it, a lot of it out there. Um, and the women being so offended over this account is interesting to see because they were way less offended when Jen lied to them for multiple seasons. And then they were less offended when Heather lied to them. Like Heather's been lying to them for seasons over a black eye. And now that it's convenient to throw Jen under the bus, Heather's going to throw her under the bus and be like, Monica, you lied to us. And my black eye, I lied to you all too at a reunion and at every interview and you're all lying to each other. Stop. And there's two things here. Can you say quasi one more time? Quasi. Oh, I love that. Okay. And then the second one is, wait a minute. She's not the only person who had a troll account, a fake account. There are multiple. And I know for a fact, I know of two other housewives Ooh, on that, same house that have troll accounts. So it's like, until the, I hope, I mm -hmm. hope they bring Monica back. I really do. Because this is all entertainment. You guys don't have to be friends. You guys are making a coin. So bring her back. Let her also bring this to light. If she does in fact know this, I don't know. Let somebody bring this to light and let's see the hypocrisy here and let's have great television because that's exactly what we're watching for. When we sit down at the end of our nine to fives or whatever you're doing and you have your glass of wine, you want to see shit hit the fan and you don't want to see it be super toxic, but you want to see kind of cotton candy drama and that's exactly what we're getting. So yeah. I'm all for it. Other people having troll accounts is wild to me. I need to see it play out on TV. I'm riveted. Also, who has the energy? Like, I'm always, I could never do reality TV. A, I don't have the courage. B, I do not have the functioning memory to be like this and this and that. Um, that worked well for me in court. I don't want to do this in my personal life. Like, I don't keep receipts on conversations that I have. I don't want to screenshot my friends' like voice recordings or whatever. Like, that's not my world. I don't want to worry that I, that somebody's going to, like have a conversation with me off camera to bring it up on camera. I, I could never, it's really interesting to watch 
it work. Like these women work behind the scenes. Their husbands work behind the scenes. They keep track of every video, tweets, who's saying what on Instagram. I'm like, oh my God, it's exhausting. I don't know how they do it. I could never. Um, and I have I have a, a lot of respect for the the energy that goes into that. They don't just like open the door to their homes and be like, hey, I'm feeding my kids this morning. There's like the the art of being a housewife has definitely evolved. Yeah, definitely. And I think that, again, honestly, if if I had my way, I wouldn't even change the cast. I would add one or two more people. And the only person's job who would be in question at this point would be Angie K. Do we keep her as a housewife full time or as a friend of because I think she's a great addition. I just I don't know yet. I think give her more opportunity. But I think that I would add one or two more people keep the exact same cast. We had guys on the finale 2 million viewers. That is back to old school Real Housewives of Atlanta, Beverly Hills views. We haven't seen that in so long. So yeah. obviously, the only thing that has changed here is that we added a new component. And I think that there is something about that that we have to take in consideration because I was a big advocate of taking out the toxicity that was Lisa Rinna from The Real Housewives of Beverly Hills last season. And now I'm looking at it watching this season and I'm like, I'm not necessarily as intrigued or enjoying it as much without that villain who was a part of it last season. And I didn't think that I would feel that way, but now watching it, it's really hard. Like I find myself like this and I don't want to be like that when I'm watching a yeah. housewife show. I want to be immersed. I I really enjoy Beverly Hills this year. Um, though the, the whole like Erica fighting at the weed dinner stuff is just so strange to watch. Um, and I'm kind of loving it. I'm like, why is Denise such a mess at these dinners? But I, I'm i enjoying some of the lighter moments of Beverly Hills with the women. We're seeing a different side of Erica, but I'm, I'm also same. I'm gaming on my phone while I'm watching. Um, but I, I love seeing how it's playing out, but I really do like the addition of Morgan Wade. Like I'm ready to watch a Morgan Wade show. Like, I want to know more about her. Like she's been really interesting and down to earth. I also love the accent. I love, like, I love everything about it. And I love that she's like that kind of fish out of water, but she doesn't give a fuck because this is not her water and she doesn't want it. And she's just so real with that. I, I don't know. I enjoy it. But I also see the fan comments of like, Kyle keeps trying to force Morgan Wade on the audience and make her career happen on this show because it benefits Kyle because Kyle's doing a documentary about her. So mm -hmm. ultimately, the more interest there is in Morgan, I'm look, I'm interested. I want to see what happens. The more interest there is in Morgan, the more interest there is in this project that Kyle's doing that drops. So I, I understand the benefit of it. I'm also not mad at a business move. Like if you're doing something for a business and you're trying to make a calculated move that is going to bring more mo like more money through the door, or whatever, yep. then I'm all for it. And I think that I'm I'm watching. You have my attention. Like if you're gonna put in the <laughs> effort, you have my attention. Yep. I'm not walking away just yet. I just want to. I am gaming on my phone while I'm watching Beverly Hills. I'm not doing yeah. that with Real Housewives. And I started um, sharing kind of my moment by moment takes when I'm watching the shows on my Instagram stories because I found it kept me more engaged in the show as an ADHD folk. <laughs> so yeah. I've I've been kind of sharing my my thoughts on it. And it was, you know, the show dealing with grief this week has been really interesting to watch it play out. And there's been some really honest, I think, moments with the women. Um that's always good to see. And I I love seeing, you know, Garcelle and Sutton's relationship together. I enjoy Crystal a lot. I, there's times I forget to read on the show and I feel bad about that. I didn't even realize Erica wasn't in the last episode at all until the end of the episode. I was like, wait a second, where was Erica? Where is she? And I, I don't know anything about Anne Marie because all she does is go after Sutton's esophagus. And I'm like, babe, you're not a doctor. Like, what are we do? Stop it. So it's been weird. And Sutton's been like, you could see Sutton be like, who are you? Like, where yeah. did you come from? And why are you here? And why are you coming for me? So. She's like, I'm done with you. It's just, she's got like one point and she's going to make it happen. I want to see some other conversations. But also, you know, what's so funny about Anne Marie is her husband is a huge controversial figure right now because he has a very popular podcast and he comes he from the world of sports and he what's also. Okay. It, there's a podcast. Everybody's got a podcast. I everybody mean, has a podcast. You and, and I both also have a podcast, but like. 
he right now is arguing, which I don't even want to get into this, but there are a lot of people gets into it. in the world of sports um, who argue which genders should be a part of which sports or, you know, and if like yeah. a male should be able to transition and be a part of a female sport because now they are identifying as a female, vice versa, whatever. So these are the conversations being had on his podcast. Yes. Which makes, him, on a reality show. which makes him a controversial figure, especially when you are coming on a network like Bravo, which is very pro LGBTQIA plus. Mm -hmm. So I'm surprised that they are not turning around some of these conversations, but I actually don't know at the time that they were filming this, had they like, I don't know if they knew about these conversations yet that her husband was having. And if you've noticed, Bravo has done a very great job. They pushed back her intro and her tagline one episode. So I think that they were trying to figure out what they were going to do with her when a lot of things were coming right. out. And then also they've sort of limited her camera time as well so i mean it has she feels like a friend of with the way we've seen her pop in and out and yeah. um she feels like she only has one plot line it's just like the esophagus at Do least i know what a freaking esophagus is now <laughs> the chat's like what did dr b say about the esophagus um dr dr b was giving me all the ins and outs of esophageal stretching because it doesn't always work for everyone. And a lot of people choose not to go through it, but because he is a maxillofacial prosthodontist and he works with people, particularly post radiation and chemo, um, with regard to oral cancers, there can be issues with esophagus rigidity and stuff like that. And he's like, um, why would anyone stretch it if you can function with workarounds? Because it doesn't always work. It can be incredibly painful, blah, blah, blah. But it's interesting seeing Amory try to diagnose Sutton when Sutton shared kind of the layman's term of like, you know that I have things going on. You know that this is like a medical issue. It would be, it for me, it felt like if somebody were coming for me like, oh my God, but you're always wearing these tinted glasses because you're like lying and hiding things. It's like, you, you know that this is neurologically appropriate. You, if I've told you there's a reason I wear them and then you come for me on it, I would be really put off. And I felt that Sutton did that too. It's like, but you told me like I told you why I don't always eat on camera because it it's a thing and it is a medical thing. So stop coming for me over it. It's interesting. Yeah, back off girl. Yeah. It's just coming for people over their medical situations is gross. I just, I don't like it at all. And it's not, I can understand Sutton's like, I don't want to have to spit something out on camera because it went down the wrong way. I don't want to choke on camera. I don't like that's uncomfortable. Um, and they tend to structure so many of the events around eating and drinking that that becomes a situation. So, yeah. So, Emory, take a step back and focus on your <laughs> husband's podcast. I mean, I don't even care about the husband's podcast, but just <laughs> introduce yourself to everybody and, like, I don't know. Get a new storyline. Coming for Sutton is not how you make yourself look better. Like, especially not at a suicide awareness. Can we not make plotline over tearing other women down? Yeah. I realize that that's maybe difficult in reality TV, but tearing other women down doesn't need to be the plot line. Well, because a lot of time, the, you know, like the whole makeup of housewives is conflict resolution. So a lot of times they want to have the sort of conflict that way they can make up. And then that gives you two episodes. And they're very smart that the ones who last are very smart in the way that they do that. And it is what it is. But that's kind of that's as Bruce Almighty says, that is how the cookie crumbles. <laughs> We're definitely, I'm still watching. Like, I'm still watching. My favorite franchise right now with Bravo, though, the my favorite thing that they're doing has been Ultimate Girls Trip. I'm oh, I, I know I I love it. Are you are you talking about Roni Legacy? All of them. I okay. love Ultimate Girls Trip. Like, I love the mix-up of Ultimate Girls Trip. I love that they kind of break the fourth wall and talk about the like housewifing of being a housewife. Like, I love. I love seeing the different casts mix it up. It's been it's been such a nice and fresh and energizing thing to see the women in different in different environments because now we know them and we want to see something else. So and really they cool. talk about they rehash their like iconic moments and stuff. And like even seeing Kelly Ben Simone when she's like, "You guys are all fans of me," and it was like <laughs> they've been on for so much longer than you. What are you talking about? It's insane. I love it. I just it, it, I love it. I love the unhingedness of it. I love that it seems to be a relatively short period of time that they film, so it's a very intense but limited experience. Um, just I I. 
I think it's really fun. So I've been I've been really enjoying that. I'm all about it. Uh, J. Michael RN. I don't think she was tearing down. She had legitimate questions as she is a medical professional. Michael, I think that so much nicer than me. <laughs> well, and I also think that um, Dr. Nicole from Miami and also Dr. Tiffany Moon from Dallas, they put this in great perspective. So just go check out their channels and their social media and you will see exactly what they said. But they said it is their duty um, to not necessarily question someone, but to be there to facilitate whatever needs that they have within their profession. Did I say that correctly? I mean, basically, but um, J. Michael RN is a, is a law nerd medical professional. Oh. So I understand what, what is being said is she had questions. Like she had questions and she wanted to understand like more deeply what Sutton was saying and her questions haven't been answered. I appreciate that perspective. Cause it's like, it, 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 the perspective is Anne Marie's not trying to make it a plot point. She came in with questions and those questions have been unresolved and she can't let it go, which would have been me if I had been on this cast with Erica with all the legal stuff. I would have been like, I have so many questions and they are not answered and you're evasively walking around it. I just don't know if it was Anne Marie's really place to do that on camera with Sutton. Um, but everybody's trying to have a moment with Sutton this season. You know, you've got, she's making out with her driver and she's licking people's toes and like she's smoking weed at the table, but she's offended by Magic Mike. Like Sutton's all over the place this season. It's kind of fun to watch. And she's raking in a cool $500,000 a month. So good for you, Sutton. And Keep she making doesn't even really give blowjobs apparently. So, I mean, like Sutton. She doesn't get second dates, let alone give a blowjob. <laughs> Cut it, Sutton. What do you mean? Love both of you. So sorry. Thank you, Courtney Williams. So sorry to go off topic, but I really hope you guys start covering the Clayton Eckerd versus Jane Doe legal drama. That would be an Emily thing. I have no idea what you're talking about. I have no idea what you're talking about, but thank you, Courtney. Thank you, Courtney. Um, so, oh, mm -hmm. Emily, we went all over the board. We talked, we, we mentioned it all. I have so much fun chatting with you. I can't wait to see you in LA. I'm sad Jason won't be there. I know. Um, so give him a hug and we will all have to hang out again between this and BravoCon. Do you, better. There, do you think VPR is going to have a finale party? Can we just plan it? Like every couple months we get to hang out because there's like a thing. Oh yeah. They'll definitely have a finale party. We should go. Oh yeah, absolutely. I was invited to last year's finale party, but we had everything going on with, I mean, you know, personal like things like moving and all of the other things and my pops and everything yeah. that we just we didn't make it and you know that even this party i almost was like i don't know and then i called emily and she's like last minute like what changed your mind and i was like i don't know maybe fomo i'm not quite sure but i'm going if you're going i'm going, you're going i'm going we're going to have a we're just gonna time. go it's going to be an interesting season this is kind of a lightning in a bottle moment um, next season probably won't be the same and the seasons to come, who knows what the world holds and who knows what tomorrow brings. This is going to be a hoot. We're going to have a laugh and that's, that's what it is. And then after that, maybe a carpet that we like that I ignore entirely. But, um, yeah. Do you I, think there's totally step and repeat carpety situation at this thing? Oh, there's going to be one for press press. I, the way that I'm imagining this, the way that they can do this, because I've never heard of them inviting the general public to something like this normally they're more exclusive but i would imagine that they would set up a whole separate step and repeat with vanderpump rules all over it for people to post and hashtag vanderpump rules and social media and then i would imagine that there would be a totally separate carpet that or section of the carpet that the cast would be doing they're not going to and this is the thing there is no way with how this show has elevated in the way that it has with the ratings and being the number one show now emmy nominated even though they didn't win but number one show on cable network that they are going to allow the cast to be so accessible by the public so i think that's one of my biggest questions going into this how are they going to divide that and make it still an experience you know we're gonna find out it we're gonna find out it's so funny is because um people feel pretty accessible at BravoCon with the way that they do it so it'll be interesting to see how this is organized and how it plays out and who we get to see and um seeing familiar faces from BravoCon that we met this year is going to be fun I'm sure some of them will be there and I look forward to seeing uh the Vanderpumpers 
And, and I look forward truly to seeing you and some of the other content creators that are going to be there. That's always a highlight for me. It's like, I know a lot of people are like, I want to talk to the cast. I'm like, first, I really do want to talk to some of the other content creators. Yeah. Them so much. So I think that it's going to be fun. It's going to be a whirlwind for me. I know that you're there for a little bit longer, but I'm going to be there for, I don't know about things. that. I'm there for like 48 hours. I'm there for 18. Hours. Okay, that's insane. I'm there for under 48 hours, but I have to go see my parents because my parents are still in LA. So, and then I I had to extend a trip because I'm speaking at a conference in Houston at the end of the week. So it was like, well, I guess I'm leaving a day early and going to LA. I called Delta. I was like, so I know I was going to Nashville to Houston. I need to go LA to Houston instead because I'm going from Nashville to LA. And they're like, yeah, we'll take care of it. So, You're like, um, switch up starting now. We're like we're just doing things that are fun this year, Adam. We're just like, you know what? Life's too short. Let's go. I love it. I love it. And I say, let's just continue doing it. Let's just do it. Let's just, it sounds fun. Let's go. And then we'll get to bring like law nerds. I'll be bringing you along with me in our member spaces. I'll be uh, posting that on Instagram and the stories. So if you guys are interested in the reality TV stuff, which I'm assuming is a yes, because you are over here um, and we get to talk all the reality stuff, then be sure to follow me and be sure to follow Adam because he's going to be doing all the behind the scenes stuff too. And he knows everybody. I do not. I am an outsider. That's like, I'm just happy to be here. And Adam's like, these are my people. <laughs> hey, thanks, Emily. And guys, for everyone who's watching and for everyone who gave super chat, super stickers, and also engaged in the live chat from the law nerd community, also to over here to the up and Adams family. Thank you so much. I know that you guys are already well aware. Um, and I've shared this, but just to kind of remind you guys, over here, um, we are promoting that we are going to be doing in January more single off podcasts episodes just once a week. That's not going to be on the YouTube channel with Jason and I. We're also doing a giveaway. So just go check out the community tab and you will figure out exactly what that giveaway is. And hopefully you enjoy it. And every single month, we're going to ramp that up as far as the retail value of that giveaway. We have a lot of great sponsors. So yeah. And then as far as going to LA and the Vanderpump Rules premiere, I can't tell you everything that we're doing after that, but we're going to be filming for members only. So check that out as well. It is Friday, guys. It is yep. time to let our hair down and go make this weekend our BIT. You know the rest of it. So smash yep. that like button, show some love. And Emily, I love you so much. Thank you. Love you, friend. Thank you. Good to see everybody. Good to see everybody. Bye, guys.